Okay, we're back. We're live four o'clock rock on a Wednesday, and you know what that means. Hawaii, energy. the state of clean energy. Energy Wednesday. Yeah, courtesy of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And guess what? Sharon Moriwaki, the co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, is right here in red. <laughs> For Christmas. For Christmas. Aloha. Welcome, Sharon. <laughs> nice to have you and be with you. Great to be and here. our special show tonight is What's on the Legislative Horizon for Energy with Representative Nicole uh, Lowen, and she is from the District 6 in Kailua, Kona, and a whole Lua Loa in the Big Island. Yeah? She's the vice chair. For vice chair. Our House Energy and of House Energy Committee, Environment and Environmental Committee, Prote whatnot. Environmental yeah. Protection. With Chris Lee. Yeah? With Chris, Chris Lee. Welcome to the show, Nicole. Nice to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. So uh, here we are, and it's um, you know the end of the year. It's, end of the year is you know traditionally a time to reflect back and also to with trepidation, <laughs> reflect Plan forward. forward. This, is, this is a year where we have a lot of trepidation on the federal level, if I may. Uh, but the question is, you know, how have we been doing in energy in <coughs> excuse me, 2016 uh, here in Hawaii? And so from the point of view of the House uh, Committee on Environment and Energy, how does, it, how does it look from your point of view? How did we do, what did we do uh, in the session, you know, this past spring, Nicole? Um, well, last session, I think there was a lot of focus on waiting to see what was going to happen with NextEra. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, there were a few measures that we had on the table we thought were maybe going to move forward that fell through at the last minute. Um, so although there were some little things that, that we did move through, I feel like compared to years before that when we made some much bigger um, and bolder steps, last year was a little bit of a quieter year, but I think that means we're ready to come back this year and really um, tackle some of the bigger questions. Is there something that was left on the table last year that you want to take forward or is it going to be new stuff uh, that we'll be looking at um, this, this coming session? Well, hopefully some of both. I mean, of course, I'm vice chair. It'll be up to uh, the chairs in large part um, what they want to consider but um, you know I think some of the things we looked at last session that I'd like to consider again would be the performance based rate making uh, we've had for several years now measures introduced to look at providing incentives for energy storage so whether that's rebates or tax credits so I'd like to um, look at that and I think then also there'll be some new things on the table as well and as well as looking back at you know even even further back we have some things I'd like to go back and look at how we can, um, you know, do some fixes and make them work a little better. For example, we had the GEMS program, which we're still kind of struggling to get up and running, and community solar as well is still kind of pending, really being implemented. So I think we could go back and examine some of um, what's happening with those as well. You know, it strikes me, we were talking before the show about, uh, you know, sort of the dampening effect that the Nextera deal had just hanging over all of us for, you know, 18 months. And I think it had, it probably had an effect on the legislature, don't you think? It probably had an effect on um, the energy committees in the legislature and the legislative view of it. Everybody, am I right? Everybody was like waiting to see what would happen. And, um, you know, not knowing, just not, not having any certainty about the, what, what the, the, the future mm -hmm. would look like. Is, am I right about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think everyone had different points of view on what they wanted to see happen. I had personally a lot of concerns about NextEra, and I think Big Island has had a lot of discussion, the island that, you know, my district is in, a lot of discussion about the potential for maybe an energy cooperative or examining some alternative um, utility business structures. And I think now that we know uh, NextEra is off the table, that we can move forward with just looking into that a little further and exploring that option and seeing if it would be to the benefit of great pairs. Can we take a moment and dwell on the Big Island just for a minute? Somebody, <laughs> somebody said to me earlier today, you know, the Big Island is really different than the rest of the state. <laughs> Some people think it's a different country. But <laughs> it has a different culture, a different way of looking at things. Certainly the politics are different. Um, you know, and the culture, you know, the, the way people see things in general, um, different than the other islands, certainly different than Oahu. Would you get a comment on that as a representative <laughs> from the Big Island, Nico? I mean, there's, I think every place has its own uniqueness. Uh, I, you know, I represent a district in West Hawaii, and I sometimes joke it's a little bit like the Wild West, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> you heard it. <laughs> it's unique, and Hawaii has its own set of unique qualities compared to the mainland, and... Um, 
you know, people in my district are, are passionate about issues and uh, on both ends of the spectrum. So, you know, I think every, even every district on Big Island is a little bit different. So for me, it's kind of hard to speak in, in generalities about that. Yeah. Interesting. So um, uh, the other thing is, you know, what, what do you sense from your constituents about what they want to see? Um, I mean, how strong, for example, are they on renewables? Um, how do they feel about geothermal? Because that's a mixed bag question, I think. Uh, how do they feel about other renewables? Uh, how do they feel about, um, you know, HIEC, you know, the, uh, the other model that uh, Marco Mangelsdorf has suggested? Um, what, what's the sense of the Big Island? Because I think it would be different than the sense of people that you ask on the street here in Honolulu. Yeah, yeah. that's a lot of questions. So I might have to, you might have to remind me of some a little in a little bit. But, um, you know, I think the energy issues are really important to people in my district. When I first ran for office, it was one of the top things I would hear about when I was out knocking on doors. And at that time, it was primarily about, you know, lowering rates because they were so high and, you know, they, they really haven't... Um, gone down that much, but I think there's at least been some leveling. Um, and people are really strong on renewable energy as well. I mean, we have, especially in West Hawaii, a really um, ideal environment to put solar on your rooftop. So when, you know, the PUC came down with their decision last year that basically did away with net metering, there was a really strong reaction to that. And um, I think also there was, uh, there's been a lot of support from what I can hear and actually did a, um, a very unscientific survey of my constituents with a postcard that I mailed out. And I think it came back um, almost 80%. It was to support, um, you know, the idea of an energy cooperative. I think it was almost 80%. Mm, interesting. And uh, I think it's, yeah, it's a little bit, it is, and so geothermal, that was the last one of the, if I don't know if I touched all the points you mentioned, but um, yeah, geothermal is controversial. Um, I think that it is um, clear that it's not compatible, it's not a compatible use with residential neighborhoods. And what's happened over in Puna hasn't um, been smooth sailing. And I think, you know, PGV, in my view, hasn't always been the best actor. And so it's kind of laid a path where there's additional and more difficult hurdles to overcome if we are going to use geothermal in the future. It does have potential health effects. I think I think they can be mitigated, but I think it's something that um, that at this point it's going to be an uphill battle to prove to a certain. Can you can you identify some of those um, barriers um, that PGV would have um, in terms of what the constituents, what your constituents uh, see as a problem, as it is another renewable? And I think you look at yeah, that I think it's the things that that that. You know, there's concerns about drilling into the ground and if it will affect the groundwater. I think there's potential for that. I mean, it's something that's discussed when they do the EA or EIS. Uh, I think there's ways to mitigate it, but there's just a lot of um, there's a lot of just emotion about geothermal in my district. I would say, and that's a difficult thing. I mean, I think that would take some time and some PR and just a lot of listening and presenting facts to to kind of turn that around. Um, I think a lot of people support it too, and they and it's. And you know, there can there the people who feel very strongly about something tend to be very noisy about it as well. But um, well, uh, you're you're on the west side of uh, on uh, both Big sides. Island, uh, and uh, you're you're not in Puna per se. But mm -hmm. I I would make a guess, and you can tell me how wrong I am, um, that the people in Puna feel mm -hmm. even more strongly um, that geothermal is not for them. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, I would I would say that that's the case from what I've heard. I mean, like I said, I haven't spoken to every individual person and asked them what they think, but I think the people that we hear from tend to be opposed. Um, so I think it's um, you know it's a it's a huge advantage potentially to have this um, renewable resource uh, that could provide baseload on our island, um, but it's gonna it's like I said it's not as smooth sailing as it will be for some other technologies and you know it's not guaranteed either I think uh, proponents of geothermal tend to act like it's uh, a sh guaranteed it's there it's easy to find I mean it can be very challenging to locate a resource and then to locate it in an area that's going to be appropriate to place it um, so there's not even a guarantee of how available it is for West Hawaii but how much uh, how much is uh, is it straight cultural you know what I mean uh, aside from the scientific concerns and the 
um, you know, the, the, the smell of sulfur, what have you, the noise, if you will. Uh, how much of it is just basic Pele? Yeah, I really don't feel like I'm in a position that I could, you know, break it down into a percentage. I, I feel like that has, um, you know, I know that was a big, bigger piece of the discussion back in, um, in the past when geothermal was, had been controversial a couple decades ago, maybe. Uh, and now I think it's, you know, it's resurfacing and there's this, you know, everything that's happening with Mauna Kea as well and wanting to be respectful of the land and places that people hold sacred. So I think that that could play a part as well. Yeah. Well, I, you know, t t just looking at the Big Island for a minute, I tell you my own story. When I first came here in uh, 1965, I remember that there was no power at South Point. In fact, the whole southern area of the Big Island did not have power. Mm -hmm. A great number of the cities, not cities, but towns in that area on both sides, east and west, had no power. And it took some time after 1965 for them to extend power. And even now today, I mean, I think there are probably more people off-grid completely, mm -hmm. just, just to the, because of the logistics of it, uh, in the Big Island than any other island. Um, and I think that there must be, um, you know, a, a greater affinity, if you will, uh, for solar off-grid, you know, complete lifestyle. And, and with that in mind, I, I'm just wondering how self-supply uh, is being received on the Big Island. Uh, on the one hand, I think you have areas where um, it's hard to make a connection with utility uh, and areas where people, you know, like to be independent, uh, just, just historically. At the same time, it costs plenty of money uh, to buy your own batteries because nobody's going to help you with that so. and so we're, we're talking about doubling the cost of a given solar installation on a you know on a residence yeah. uh what kind of what kind of a reception is so, uh, self-supply getting these days um you know my district is more the urban area so in my district there's probably less of the going off grid um but it's true there is a lot more on, on big island in general um, well, I think it's at the point, too, where it's kind of the only option. I mean, the pretty much net metering is not an option anymore. And then um, grid supply, I think they're at or nearing their cap in any case. So, I mean, if people want to connect, then it's, it's kind of grid supply and get a battery or, or nothing. So I think that's part of a, the good argument for this being the year that we start looking at um, uh, and a storage credit of some kind or storage rebate to to help those folks and to kind of make it a little more equitable. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think that's a really valuable issue, and I hope you do take that up this year. Yeah, uh, I think it's really important not only the Big Island but all around town because of the the end of uh, net energy metering and the beginning of self supply, which is, you know to me was just a matter of shifting the burden of buying storage you know, from larger institutions to individuals. Um, but, but it's a solution. It bypasses a lot of the, the, the issues we were having before about mm -hmm. the ability to accept a certain level of, uh, of uh, renewables. And I think in the end, you know, assuming we can all afford it, it may, it may help us move forward now. Um, the, the, I guess the question is, uh, how much interest is there in your committee and in the legislature to give, you know, incentives to self-supply and storage? Well, I mean, I support it and I, um, you know, I can't speak for other legislators, but I know like Chris uh, Lee has supported it um, in the past. So, uh, you know, I think there's always that question when you do a tax credit or rebate, it has some impact on the budget. So you have to look at it. The idea of a tax credit, the way it works is economic impact overall or the impact of you know, reaching your policy goals that have some greater good is how you balance out the financial cost of the tax credit. But you have to also make sure that it fits into the big picture of the budget and convince everyone that that's a, that it's a, the, the trade-off works. Is this a great country or what? <laughs> was, uh, I also was going to mention when you were asking about um, the grid supply versus self-supply. Uh, the other thing I would like to see the PUC work on, or the legislature, if if um, you know we're if we can, is to have a better time of use program because that could go a long way in replacing net metering and create the incentives for people to use energy the t the time of day we want them to use and give them kind of a break to help them make the putting solar panels on cost effective. Um, 
And I think PUC did something, but it was really like a pilot program and not very far reaching. Right, right. A couple of thousand, I think. It's a pilot program. And, and uh, some people say that, uh, you know, that the, the, the cost during peak hours is greater than mm. now. And uh, obviously the cost during non-peak hours is less. Um, but you've got to watch out because you could wind up netting yourself a higher electric bill than a lower electric bill. So we have to see how this all works yeah. out. And that's why, I, I mean, I would certainly agree with the idea of having a pilot project, not for the technology mm -hmm. of it, but to see the human conduct involved, to see whether they really get the message uh, and, and uh, you know, do what is intended, what intended to be uh, in, you know, incentivized. Um, and and maybe, maybe this is a, a big thing, but we, we won't know yet. And I don't think that pilot project is on the Big Island anyway. I think it's on uh, Oahu, maybe. Um, and I think we should all be watching it and the legislature, too, because if it looks like it's going to be something good, maybe it connects up with other incentives or de-incentives, sure. as the case and may I, be. And I was a little disappointed because I don't think we need a, such a restricted pilot project to be able to figure out that this is a program that can work. And I, yeah. I feel a little bit like it was kind of dragging heel dragging on implementing it on a broader scale. Yeah. Let's take a short break, Nicole. That's Nicole Lowen. She's representative from District 6, Kailua Kona and Holua Loa, and uh, Sharon Moriwaki, my co-host. And we're going to take a short break. You'll see. We'll come back. We'll be right here. Don't go away. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech. On Center Stage, I talk with really amazing artistic guests about what they do, how they do it, and the most important point, why they do it. I think, I hope, the show is inspirational for everyone. I know it's always inspirational for me. I'm also the managing director of Kumukuhua Theater, which is right next door, and I happen to have with me now Will Kahele, who is an artist. We just finished a conversation. I hope you can catch on center stage. And we work together at Kumukuhua Theater. Why should people come over there? Because it's a great place to see uh, plays written by uh, local playwrights. Why should people watch this show? Oh, because, um, because it's cool and it's uh, great things to know every week. And because, you know, you are a very cool hostess. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you. Give me my money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're back. We're live with Nicole Lowen, representative from District 6 on the Big Island. And my co-host, Sharon Moriwaki, we're talking about what's on the legislative horizon for energy this coming year, starting in January 12th. No, Saturday, 15th, no, fif no 18th. When, when does it open up, Nicole? 18th is it? Uh, January 18th, Wednesday. Yeah, because I usually start fasting about a week before. <laughs> <laughs> can feed myself. <laughs> Let's talk for a minute about the national scene. Um, I, I don't want to you know, tell anybody anything they don't know already, but Donald Trump was elected. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very unpredictable. You can and say it's that. very unpredictable, both on the environmental side and also on the energy side. Um, and he's, you know, he's following through on being unpredictable. <laughs> <laughs> so one of those areas of non-predictability is, uh, is on energy, and he seems to favor coal <laughs> and other fossil fuels. Um, this runs counter to, you know, the direction of Hawaii. And I wonder, um, you know, how you must think about this, how, how worried should we be? about losing federal funding or dealing with regulations uh, that are um, inconsistent with our own policies. What do you think, Nicole? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think what's happening is a little bit terrifying. Um, just to think of who will be in charge of some of these agencies and, and what positions they've taken on things that are important to us here. Um, but I think Hawaii will be able to continue to stick to our policy and, you know, we, it may be if, we, if they sort of uh, allow this unfettered, um, you know, development of all our natural resource, resources and fossil fuels that you could see the cost um, go down, but I don't think that will change our policy to move to 100% and it will still reduce costs for ratepayers in the meantime. Um, we'll, we're not getting off of oil or coal tomorrow, unfortunately, so there's still some time, you know, quite a bit of time to, to work with that. It does, um, you know, create a challenge in the, the competition. I mean, it makes the competition for renewables a little tougher. Mm -hmm. And um, just, yeah, I mean, I think I would worry about things like the tax credits, uh, you know, for the first, for uh, residential PV. I think they've already taken such a big hit 
uh, from the things that we did here in state that to think about you know changes to that would be uh, difficult for the industry um, and you know there's there's other there's so many ways that I'm concerned about this new administration uh, but I think that you know I'm committed to I think the state is committed to continuing to move forward with our goals we here in Hawaii I think for the most part we know climate change is happening and um, I think, in, at least in my district, there's a lot of support for uh, moving towards 100% renewable and sticking with our plan. Yeah. Amen to that. You know, it's, it's, if you follow this uh, since, uh, look at the history of it since, well, since the beginning of the Energy Policy Forum, which was in the early 2000s, and, and since the famous or infamous Energy Agreement of 2008, um, what you see is uh, great goals. And, and last year, you know, with the 45, uh, uh, 2045, 100% renewable target. Um, what you see is these great goals, these great aspirations, and then, you know, a road full of distractions and potholes, may I say. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's the important thing, and by the way, and I, I, see, I see Trump as a, a huge distraction. Whether he has direct effect on our efforts and our initiatives or indirect, you know, sort of public psychology effects, on our initiatives, it will be still yet another distraction. Um, and what we can't afford to have is distraction of any kind. So I, I absolutely agree with what you said, Nicole, is we have to keep on trucking here. Um, we have to, we have, we can't be distracted, not by this or anything. Yeah. 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 So, and, yeah. And particularly, I mean, Hawaii's never had its own resources that aren't renewable energy resources in any case. So we are still better off in either scenario being independent and having control of our, our own energy. So I think we have that at least that advantage here. Yeah. Well, the Big Island is a great place for leadership on this because you do have the resources and your, your numbers are great compared to the other islands, even Kauai. <laughs> And so, and so, you know, you, all you have to do is continue making, making way for that target. But let's talk about the intersection of energy and transportation, which everybody will agree with we're a little behind, and it's partly because everybody loves fossil fuel cars and they don't want to give them up. Um, and, I mean, Sharon and I have spent a fair amount of time looking at transportation. Mm -hmm. The Energy Policy Forum is very interested in transportation. DBED is very interested in transportation. Um, and, you know, uh, it's important that we take, you know, steps we might not otherwise think of, that we, you know, invent new initiatives or sub-initiatives to make sure something happens in transportation. After all, six billion is still the number of dollars that we send offshore for fossil fuel that has not really declined in any material way. We recently got a press release, I think it was from Hawaiian Electric, that we'd reached uh, 5,000 uh, renew uh, rather electric cars in the state. Uh, that's not nearly enough. Uh, I think some people believe, a lot of people believe that electric cars is the way to um, energize or at least do clean energy on transportation. How do you feel about that, Nicole? And what kind of legislative uh, initiatives would you, you know, would be considering? Um, well, I think there's been a lot of action on transportation from, um, you know, agencies, from, you know, NGOs, from a lot of other organizations, but it's an area where I think the legislature has actually lagged behind a little bit. And um, I think there's a lot that we could do. I mean, we could look at establishing goals similar to what we have for the renewable portfolio standards for transportation. Uh, we can look at incentives or ways to, um, to you know, to create mandates that would help to it make the infrastructure more robust for electric vehicles. Um, and yeah, I think we, we definitely need to think about that, not just electric vehicles, of course, because, well, a few things. I mean, we, we would love to see more electric vehicles on the road, and I think we've got to consider that like the most viable alternative right now. Um, but there's also hydrogen, especially as a potential uh, fuel for mass transit. Um, and then we have to remember, too, with electric, um, you know, you get more and more electric vehicles, you're increase, increasing your demand for electricity. So you have to make sure that the additional electricity that you're adding is coming from renewables and not from a fossil fuel source. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and then also, it, you know, it does nothing to mitigate traffic problems if you have uh, everybody just trading out their fossil fuel burning vehicle, combustion engine for an electric vehicle. So we have to also continue to 
invested in mass transit and bike lanes and just other transportation alternatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Big Owl is a great laboratory for this, you know, because it's big, for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> and because people, you know, uh, are, are going gangbusters on solar. And if you have solar on your roof, then you can, you know, charge your own car. And, uh, and the whole, you know, idea of having a perimeter road makes it easier to put charging stations in remote locations because that road is going to be, a, a, you know, a, a central thoroughfare. But let me add that if... If I have a, an island like Oahu with a just over a 100-mile perimeter, um, that's nothing, and, and we still haven't worked out range anxiety. That's nothing compared to the big island with a perimeter of like 300 and change miles. Um, that would give me much greater range anxiety. How do you yeah. deal with that? Are you putting in stations there? Are you behind initiatives for that? Yeah, actually, um, Helco put in a new one just fairly recently um, right in Kailua town and uh, there are some here and there but it's not something that is I think on most people's radar yeah. I think you know people I know some people who have electric vehicles you don't see a ton of them and I think a lot of them probably end up charging them mainly at home the the um, Hawaii Natural Energy Institute has the pilot in in the volcano national park with hydrogen vehicles I just wonder how or that would go in addition to the EVs of using hydrogen as your fuel source. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see it work. I'm not sure how, you know, it's, it's uh, if you're going to invest in an alternative infrastructure, I don't know what the additional, I honestly don't know the answer what the additional cost is. If you're looking at EV infrastructure and hydrogen, um, I don't, you know, I mean, at this point, I, it would be a handful of cars or vehicles that would even be servicing, but I know that there's, they're, they're transitioning some of the um, public transit vehicles for that. I mean, I'm, I'm excited about all these options and probably I, I have to learn more about the trade-offs or if it's like all of the above is a possibility. Um, but yeah, we need to, to do more. So Nicole, all things considered, uh, now that the sort of the, 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 the cloud of the next era uh, experience is, is not overhead anymore, and now presumably all those bottled up ideas and thoughts and initiatives and programs that we might not have you know been been able to deal with while that cloud existed uh, now now we're free liberated i guess in some way um do you see this uh, 2017 session as being a, a big year for energy do you see this as being a kind of watershed moving forward to 2045 or will it be a, a struggle again um you know politics is hard to predict so i i don't think I can say for sure. I hope that we get at least a few, um, you know, big things through. I'm hopeful that, that we'll be able to, and, um, you know, we'll just have to see. Yeah. One last question is, I'm so curious about this. You know, you're, you're on the, the Committee for Energy and Environment, Environment and Energy, <clears throat> and you have a lot on your plate from both sides of that, but I wonder, um, what's your favorite area? <laughs> what do you spend your time at two o'clock in the morning when you wake up? But you wake up thinking about energy or environment. <laughs> oh, interesting question. Um, you know, I think I probably came into this position when I first ran for office with a lot more knowledge in the like quote unquote environment, and even um, some of the things that don't uh, necessarily go through the environment committee, but maybe are more under like waterland or agriculture, but are still environmental issues. And I've learned so much about energy in the last four years. Um, which I really do enjoy. So I think, um, uh, yeah, I really have to pick favorites. Try to be <laughs> diplomatic now, Nicole. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I do, I enjoy the energy, energy, um, the jet energy issues. It's interesting. And there's a lot going on. I think it's, it's really exciting to be at the leading edge of things in the nation right now. And, um, and there's a lot of hope and, things that are things that are changing and new things we'll be able to implement which is uh, exciting so right now I'm, I'm enjoying that a lot but all of, I but I enjoy many different areas of policy making great Nico I'm, I'm gonna ask Sharon to close and okay. in closing Sharon I hope you remind Nicole yet again come down to the energy oh, policy right. forum she briefing is? on January 12th go ahead Sharon okay thanks Nicole for being with us and sharing with us and last what happened last year and going forward and we really do look forward to hearing more from you and from the committee uh, and do come uh, to our energy briefing we hope to address some of these 
of the continuity of the past going forward and hopefully we can work together for a bright future and a good session. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Nicole. Thanks so much. Aloha, Representative uh -huh. from the Big Island. Aloha.